Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Ann McDonough. I'm the Deputy Director here at the DC History Center, and I am so excited that you're here to join us tonight for this conversation with Carrie Cotton Williams of the Library of Congress in conversation with Charles Francis. Um, it is awesome to see so many friends from the Rainbow History Project here, from the Mattachine Society, researchers, folks who I think it might also be their first visit to the Kiplinger Research Library. Um, so if you've never been here before, please raise your hand. On a special yeah. So thank you so much for uh, spending your evening with us. Those who have been here before might know that once you come once, we get our claws in you and you keep coming back. So um, please do so. Um, at the DC History Center, we aim to deepen understanding of our city's past, to connect, empower, and inspire. And tonight, we hope to inspire, I have to look at my cheat sheet here because I'm going to be quoting. Um, we're good, looking to inspire you all to be um, activists, archive activists, and to use Charles's words uh, from the book that we hope you're going to purchase um, from our store right across Memorial Hall. Um, that means to use your discoveries and the power of history to fight for social justice, equality, and even our own safety. Um, and so with that, I'm going to hand the uh, conversation over to Carrie. Um, who's going to lead the conversation and moderate questions as we have time. And so with that, Carrie, please introduce yourself, set the scene, and then bring us into the world of archive activism with Charles Francis. Thank you. That's a big job. <laughs> Hello, I'm Carrie Cotton Williams. Um, I know a few of you here, and I hope to meet all of you before you leave. Um, welcome to the DC History Center, which is a place um, that has been a very good friend to me while I've been in DC. Um, I joined um, the Library of Congress Manuscript Division team as the uh, head of Reference and Reader Services a couple of years ago. But before that, I was the manager of the People's Archive, which includes Washingtoniana, the Black Studies Center, and the Peabody Room at Georgetown. Um, so I've been in DC for a while and I have deep roots here. And I was telling Anne that um, oftentimes we have these conversations in our own circles and we don't oftentimes have the conversations across uh, communities and, and across differences. So I'm very excited to be here to talk to you, Charles. Um, so Charles, well, let me back up and just say how this is going to work because we're on a <laughs> we're on a schedule and I respect time. My wife knows that I respect time. Um, we have about 45 minutes for the conversation that I'll be facilitating with Charles, and then we'll have about 10 minutes for questions and answer. And I'm going to remind you later, but we will focus on questions and not comments and questions, but questions. So if you're thinking about your question, I ask that you start thinking about that now. Have a nice, succinct question. I think um, there was a previous book talk that said it ends with a question mark. Um, so, and then after that, we will um, proceed to Memorial Hall, and you will be able to purchase uh, Charles's book, um, and he will be available to sign um, for, for a little while. So I'm excited to, to, to welcome you all. Um, Charles Francis, as many of you know, um, is the co-founder of the new or repurposed Medishing Society. Um, he is also a retired public affairs consultant whose corporate clients included uh, uh, Chase Manhattan Bank, AT&T, and Exxon Mobil. Um, I also know him uh, as someone who uh, was really helpful in advocating for uh, the Frank Kameny papers to be um, transferred to the Library of Congress as, uh, as well as Lily Vincent. So um, thank you for your work, for your, for your advocacy, Charles. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm delighted and excited to be here. Uh, I'm a Texas native, but have lived in the district for four decades now. So I think it's exciting as anything to be at the DC History Center. It's exactly where this kind of subject should be discussed archive activism. And as I look across the room, I know a lot of you are archive activists. So I'm humbled to tell you this story. Uh, also excited about it. Um, I submitted my manuscript to the University of North Texas Press, UNT Press in Denton, Texas. Uh, they are part of the University of Texas system. And they are the largest LGBTQ archive in Texas. So it's a perfect place for me to submit my manuscript telling this story. And they said, we love it, but 
got a problem. I thought, oh boy, it's too gay, or uh, <laughs> it's too political, or it's not queer enough, or something. They said, nope, the problem is you used exclamation points 340 <laughs> times <laughs> in this manuscript. They said, look at your word and search your exclamation. It's a disaster. This is the sign of a amateur uh, vanity biography, and you know, we're just not going there. I said, well, let me get rid of all the exclamation marks, uh, except gay is good. We'll keep one exclamation mark on gay is good. But uh, I love archive activism and have spoken about it a lot. And once my co-founder, Pate Feltz, and I were at William & Mary, the College of William & Mary, talking about archive activism to some students. And looking in the back of the room, back of the audience, was a student and she was holding up a big sign that said, research equals activism. And I thought, that's exactly what we do. R equals A. Research not for academia or research not on your PhD or to become a historian or to act as a historian, but research to help make the world a better place. So archive activists, in a nutshell, we find the stuff and then we use it to the extent that we can. We find the horrible horribles and we work with a law firm, McDermott, Will and Emery, and we turn these mind-blowing documents into legal products for amicus briefs or white papers or testimony or media briefings. Um, so I brought a, a, a uh, archival storage bin so, so you know the river we fish in. And uh, I have one document that I wanted to uh, point out, uh, which is on the cover of this book. Um, it was written in 1964 by a guy named Mr. Steele at the Civil, U.S. Civil Service Commission. And he was a lawyer, John W. Steele, November 1964. It took us uh, three FOIA requests to discover this thing. And uh, we went to the U.S. Civil Service Commission, defunct. We went to the Office of Personnel Management. Sorry, we can't help you. Uh, NARA, uh, well, if we can find it, it's classified. So we had to get it declassified, and that took a ton of work. And so I guess two or three years into this, we found this thing. And to me, it's the foundation of the, of the raw animus directed toward our community for decades following World War II, and we're still dealing with it. It says, our tendency to lean over backwards to rule against a homosexual is simply a manifestation of the revulsion which homosexuality inspires in the normal person. What it boils down to is that most men look upon homosexuality as something uniquely nasty, not just as a form of immorality. So I am very proud that we found the uniquely nasty document, a kind of Rosetta Stone for what we're trying to talk about. And equally happy to uh, associate my, my book uh, with being uniquely nasty. <laughs> so that's, that's where we got this. Um, go ahead. I have a question, Charles. Fire away. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing, you know, what you've been working on, I guess, uh, for, you said, when we were talking previously about 10 years. Yes, 10 years. Uh, um, can you sort of ground that work and talk a little bit about how you came to this um, archive activism, uh, specifically with the Madison Society, and also your work with Frank Kameny, and how you, you know, began this journey? Well, uh, this journey to me uh, begins with, uh, I met a hoarder once, and meeting that hoarder changed my life. Uh, that hoarder was Dr. Franklin E. Kameny. Uh, when I met him, I think he was 
phasing into stage three of hoarding. And I don't know if anyone here has known a hoarder or been in a hoarder's house, but I'm not just talking about clutter or mess. This is aisles. You carve through piles of books and papers and briefs. And the kitchen can't go in there. It's, it's full, floor to ceiling. Dining room, boom, likewise. Upstairs, bedroom, gone. Uh, it was a hoarder's house. And I had met Frank at my place uh, in his uh, 80s. And uh, I was so honored and thrilled to meet him because he was at the end stage of his activism. He had been sort of turned into a Mr. Magoo kind of a figure. Uh, didn't really get the identity letters L, G, B, T, Q, I, A, plus. Just, he was from a Washington of gays and lesbians and investigations and arrests and persecution. And he impressed me greatly. So I got, got to know him and um, came to realize he was near destitute and calling me and others, many in this room, for help. My phone, my taxes, help. And so we all did, everyone chipped in and worked really hard with Frank out of love and devotion to his historical role as lead pioneer. Um, so I went over to see him at his house and walked into this place, and I mean, it blew my mind. And I was so excited to be there, but the mold and the spores and the mess and the, the disarray all passed me by because I was looking around with a kind of grim fascination at what was this stuff? It was the history of uh, the epicenter of Washington, D.C., LGBT, civil rights, all in this house on New Mexico Avenue. And I said, Frank, we gotta do something here. I can use it to, we can use it, uh, working with people like Bob Wittick and Rick Rosendahl and Pate Feltz and others, we can use it to raise money at the exact price that we'll get a uh, uh, appraiser to put on this stuff. And I know Alan Stipek in Second Story Books at DuPont Circle, and he's appraised a million people's papers, and we'll get him to appraise yours um, at the highest price that he can support. And then we'll get you that money, and with Rick Rosendahl, we will apportion that money to you on a monthly basis to keep you going for the rest of your life. So we had all the boxes at my house, and Alan Stipek comes over and goes, Charles, I've looked at it, and i got to tell you, you know, there's no market for gay paper. I mean, if it was Margaret Thatcher or Ronald Reagan or, you know, a star, Rock Hudson, that's one thing. But this, I said, he said, members of Congress think they have valuable papers. I said, don't compare us to members of Congress. <laughs> he said, okay, I said, so what is a good price? He said, well, I have found this, I have found that, I have the other thing, I'll give you a, uh, an appraisal, and you can go raise the money. Uh, and it'll stand up, thanks to uh, Randy Joyner, our lawyer, it'll stand up to the IRS scrutiny, and we'll do this. So we went down that road with Frank, and Thus began the archive activism, and it did not begin in academia. It did not begin uh, in scholarly work. I'm not a historian. I don't have a PhD. But archive activism for me began in Frank's chaos. And we were able, he trusted us enough to turn that chaos into an archive. And could you, um, I know that there are people in the audience who knew Frank. Oh, very yes. well. Um, but I've apologized people, yeah. to them for talking too much about No, Frank. no, no, but some people did not know him or his work. And, and I, I guess some of the questions would be, why were his papers, why this collection, why was it so important? you know, for you to, to actually put forth that effort and to work with, you know, your colleagues to, to save this history. What did that mean 
for a movement? What did it mean for LGBTQ history? You know? Yeah. Well, in a, in a quick summary, uh, Frank was a Harvard-trained uh, astronomer. Um, he was a World War II veteran, had served in Germany. A uh, brilliant man, um, was working for the U.S. Army Map Service. And in 1957, they found out he was gay and they fired him. Um, but they fired the wrong guy because he fought them for the rest of his life. He fought them in the trenches. He fought them in the courts. He wrote the first Supreme Court brief of any LGBTQ case. Uh, and that was in 1961. And from there on, this guy pretty much invented the, the model that all of us use today in terms of advocacy, uh, lobbying, uh, public outreach, and a kind of in-your-face exclamatory ad advocacy that he called a new militancy. So that's Frank, the grandfather of, of this movement. And we were so honored to give his stuff to the library. 60,000 items. Uh, Eric Cervini in his book, The Deviant's War, estimated that would be stacked item on item would be a six-story tall building. And it's all there at the library in the manuscript division, brought to order out of the chaos of, of his trove. I'd say it's well used. <laughs> It's um, probably a pretty busy archive. It is a busy archive. Um, I have another question in terms of um, trust and trust building in, in donor relationships and, and how that informs your archive activism. You're not from DC, right? Right. <laughs> You're from Dallas, which is a long way from DC. So how did Frank come to trust you? And how did other individuals that you work with come to trust you? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, I think uh, Frank was at a rough spot in his life. Um, I was at a sort of a gray middle age point of my life looking for something new that was meaningful. Um, and I understood that what he had was emotional as much as it was paper. Um, and I learned that the hard way when I was at his house once. I saw this filing cabinet, and it's just erupting papers. I have a picture of it in the book. I mean, it is a volcano of paper. And I got down on my knees, and I go, Frank, you saved everything. And he freaked out. He just started screaming, get out. And I realized then that this was an emotional piece of his life, like an arm or a leg. It was his entire world this stuff and so I did my very best to build that emotional trust with Frank mm -hmm. and in some ways I mean you're working with with other you're working with a law firm you have um, paid who's also working with you but there's like a team of people who are working on these projects it's not just you right right what what happened over the years uh, we had the great fortune to add the second leg of our chair, which is a relationship with a law firm, a great international law firm by the name of McDermott, Will, and Emery, uh, with offices in New York and Washington and worldwide. And Lisa Linsky and Paul Thompson there wanted to be a part of this because when I showed them the uniquely nasty letter, they said, Charles, this is evidentiary history. I said, evidentiary history? Yes, this goes into court and into filings and into briefs. That's how powerful this stuff is, and we can help you do that. So that was a real breakthrough for our archive activism. You need a relationship with a pro bono law firm to help you do the filings and to get the public document releases and uh, all of that. And McDermott. Uh, they got associates and partners and youngers and olders uh, in the firm uh, to volunteer pro bono. And by the end of it, we had 20. Mm -hmm. And we had Friday afternoon calls, and we would go down our list. Pate and I would just go down our list. We haven't heard yet from the library. We haven't heard yet from NARA. Where, where is this FOIA? 
you know, we'd go down that. And so McDermott, Will & Emory, in partnership with us, were able to do all of this. And they are thrilled with this book, thank goodness. <laughs> Um, I had a question when we had previous conversations, you know, leading up to this conversation. Um, I wanted to know how you saw yourself in terms of queer community and queer communities in plural, right? Um, and how you see yourself as both an insider because you have some privilege, you know, and you also are an outsider, depending on the group that you are, you know, working with. And I think in the book you really talk a lot about that, you know, dual role uh, in your work with Rust College, which was an HB is an HBCU um, that has a particular kind of history that you were trying to rescue, um, as well as um, sort of amplify and to show why this is important in lots of communities, not just the ones that, that you are most familiar with. Can you talk some about that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I won a, a birth lottery, I guess, by being born in Dallas, Texas, to a prominent family that had, that had money going back to 1900. And um, so I had that, that bubble. Uh, but I also had a profound sense of otherness when I started figuring out I was gay or queer. Um, and uh, that profound sense of otherness gave me just enough alienation from my life to, uh, to move on in a, in a more uh, aware manner. Uh, in the West, they say, well, what was the burr in your saddle? I go, well, it was being, being queer in the 50s and 60s. And um, in those days, in the 50s and 60s, when you found out you were part of this community, you didn't have any real words. But you were given a kind of passport, a passport to another country. And that passport would transcend race and class and nation and so many barriers because you had that one thing in common of being an outsider uh, and moving away and rejoicing really in being an outsider. So um, the Kameny stuff, uh, here we are in the middle of uh, the District of Columbia focusing on federal employment. Frank Kameny, U.S. Civil Service Commission, um, a totally white male world of men losing their jobs because they were investigated and gay or booted from the military. We wanted to move out and go out into the country um, and find a story that would intersect uh, race, voting rights, civil rights, and so we'd been following same-sex marriage very closely um, because of our uh, amicus brief in the Obergefell case. So we were following same-sex marriage. And in 2014, U.S. District Court Judge Carlton Reeves uh, in Mississippi uh, came out with an opinion striking down Mississippi's uh, same-sex marriage ban and he said, this is a connection. The Klan tied the perverts, the agitators, the Negroes, the Jews, the communists, all into one ball of hate. Uh, and so you can't unravel this stuff. But he said one great example was what happened at Rust College, an HBCU in a little town called Holly Springs, Mississippi. And he wrote and he footnoted uh, some information that the openly gay African-American students, 64, and openly gay African-American faculty and administration joined hands with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and made their campus a so-called uh, Freedom Summer campus following the leadership of Bob Moses, who said, we have to go down south now this summer, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have uh, our anchor be these colleges and these college kids. And they'll help us give out books, help us register voters, so on. So the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission 
which is this outrageous police state commission, um, targeted the perverts and they targeted the agitators and the Negroes. So the chapter is called Negroes, Agitators, and Racial Perverts. Racial perverts, try to unravel what that is, you know, I mean. So they went after the racial perverts and the students and they got, and so I went to my connections down in Mississippi and I had gone to school with a guy named Bill Luckett, and so, and he was, had been the mayor of Clarksdale, and I went to Bill and I said, Bill, help me unravel this. I want to see what happened to those openly gay kids in the 60s. And he said, well, I think I can do it. I'm a partner, I own a blues club uh, owned by me and my partner, Morgan Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh my God, so you and Morgan Freeman can help me enter this world and get the facts. And so that's what happened. Mm -hmm. So uh, at Ground Zero Blues Club, Bill and Morgan Freeman uh, hooked me up with a guy named Leslie Burl McLemore, mm -hmm. who was the president of the student council at Rust in 1964 and was the founding member of the NAACP at Rust and sworn in by Medgar Evers himself. So Les McLemore plugged me into Rust and we found out some awful truth. And when I was reading that story, I'm a, I'm a graduate of an HBCU, uh, not in 1964. <laughs> 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 not so, like, it was a while ago, but there, um, there is, um, in terms of even my most recent experience in history in the South at an, at an HBCU to talk openly about, you know, queer history called not even queer then, but gay, you know, being gay or lesbian, like that's something that was not uh, necessarily acceptable or supported or promoted. And so you're coming down there, you're a white man, going down, I mean, going to Russ College and sort of digging up this history again and communicating and engaging people in community and people who moved away, what was the reaction? Well, the reaction was super friendly. I mean, everybody at Russ just uh, really welcomed this. Uh, I was, I was low-key, but I went to the Leontine Price Library on the campus of Russ College and this is named for Leontine Price herself, the, the greatest soprano who ever lived, or certainly in my lifetime. Her mother went to Rust, and so Leontine Price got them the money for this library. And in that library is an archive of that Freedom Summer, and that's where I really sort of hit a, a gold mine. And they couldn't have been more helpful. Um, but. I'm still waiting for the board at Russ College to acknowledge what happened to Dr. Ernest Andrew Smith, their president at the time. He had to step down because the Sovereignty Commission handed this raw sewage dirt over to their Methodist board at Rust, and that cost Dr. Smith his job. Dr. Smith moves to Washington, D.C. and becomes a, you know, a really stalwart member of the Methodist community here and the Methodist uh, organization here. P.S. None of the white historians ever reported on this. Uh, Taylor Branch in his three volumes, no. Calvin Trillin, no. It just was erased. And the reason why? Everyone had an incentive to erase it. Certainly Dr. Smith, he didn't want to say, I am not a queer, you know. The uh, gay, openly gay students, I went to see one of them who was in his 80s in Montgomery, and he said, this would have cost us our ability to ever teach. We would never have gotten another job. This, in 1964, the Civil Rights Act wasn't for queer people. We weren't covered. Um, so they all had an incentive to just bury this and move on. But I think for our community, archive activists should ask that it not be buried because it's so important to us to have really great stories of the intersection. Uh, and in this case, voting rights, civil rights, and 
perverts who could live openly in that time. Bayard Rustin, of course, was out at a year or two before that. So all the kids, it didn't bother them one whit that there were gays among them. But looking back, I think it's important to, to say it happened. So in terms of um, the book, you have it structured where you're, you're talking about your life, your early life growing up, moving through your professional career, careers, your work um, with archive activism, and you actually you end your book uh, with a set of principles um, that ground archive activism, which I think is really useful um, when you are, are given a set of tools or resources to really think through how you might, you know, create a project that is um, identifying, you know, a history that has been erased or has not been amplified. And so these 13 principles, I think, are, are really useful by any community. And when you're talking about intersectionality, you know, one of them, uh, I think you talk about for, for youngers, is really important to have the conversation with the olders, um, to cross difference. And what does that mean you know, for, for the work that you do? If you hadn't talked to Frank Kameny, you know, we wouldn't have the, the preservation of his papers. Or if, you know, perhaps, you know, students at Rust College would not have known that that history um, actually happened at their, at their school. So can you talk a little, about, a little bit about some of these principles? Yeah, I put some principles down and people here live them. I mean, I'm here with the, uh, for instance, the Rainbow History Project. We know in this room what community historian activism is and why it is urgently important especially with the regulation of history teaching now in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I list some principles and the, uh, the uh, younger mm -hmm. elder principles. Uh, for youngers, talk to LGBT elders, make those connections, tear down the walls between LGBTQ generations, the distrust and ageism rampant in our community. Frank Kameny was in his 80s with a world up in his attic. Pull down that ladder, climb up there, think like historian Alan Barabe, who researched a cache of letters discovered in a dumpster to begin his groundbreaking history of gays who served in the military. Ask olders questions, tape record them. If they were around in 65, 69, 70, they've got a story and we need to save it. Um, and a good example is uh, the Invisible Histories Project down in Alabama, which is focused on saving Southern LGBTQ history. These history projects are popping up all across the country, and they're not your, your grandmother's history projects. They're activist <laughs> history projects. They're saying, we want to know what happened, and we want to use it to make our case that we are not groomers and we are not the enemies of society. We are part of it and our history. We, we should let these people say, and I say, let the force of history run through us. Um, so the force of history running through us, and that's the, the older, younger point I make. What about the um, practice and study public history? Uh, we had a conversation about actually, you know, what does it mean to be able to walk into an archive to oh. feel empowered to walk into an archive, to do the work, to ask a librarian or archivist, how do I, what's the finding aid, you know? Is this history here? Like there's empowerment there. There are also barriers, as we all know. Um, but this is one of your principles to, to, to research. Yeah, I mean, part of, the, most of the book is LGBTQ equality and the, the fight to recover our history. But the other large part of it is the archive is for all of us. And the archive is a world uh, of information and inspiration that anyone has access to, I say, armed only with a library card. All you need is a library card. You need not be intimidated. I say don't be intimidated by the manuscript division. They love archive activists down we there. We do love <laughs> archive activists. <laughs> And all you need is a library card and, and the self-image that you can walk into a, an archive. Show your, like, your card and ask for a finding aid and go get the file and then they'll bring a wooden cart to your table with 10 boxes just like this and it's each four, one of them is charts. loaded. <laughs> 
so um, yeah, getting people, popularizing archive research, that is a really important thing that we can do to connect people with history, no matter what marginalized group you're from. So. And we wouldn't be able to do any research if there were no papers in, in places, right? Yeah. So, you know, that, that principle of identifying, well, first of all, accepting uh, the fact that you do have a collection of personal materials. And you may be a hoarder, you may not be a hoarder. But, you know, it's, don't throw it away in, before you have a conversation with someone, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the greatest danger to the gay archive is the garbage bag. You don't have a will, you don't have a plan, you've uh, got all these boxes and you downsize, you leave your office, you move to another office, you, then you move back in home or get a assisted living and suddenly those boxes are just molding away and you die and boom, the garbage bag. Uh, it used to be the bonfire. I think it's the garbage bag now and every young person needs to help their elders get organized with those things. It can be so intimidating to know that you have a closet full of boxes and how are you going to get up there? How are you going to... Uh, I think it's politically important to save our materials. And I would say that a lost cell phone is also an archive. <laughs> um, so, you know, thinking about your digital, you know, archives. And a lot, of, a lot of the work that now when you're talking about, you know, saving an archive, the work that's being done, particularly with the Alabama project, um, people are really looking at local organizations and activists and how they create that history. And oftentimes it is digital. Sometimes it's a flyer. Sometimes it, it seems like it's meaningless. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you, Anne. So, and that is really a, a, an appropriate um, um, thing to bring up. If you're just getting started with your archive activism journey, you can check out the DC History Center's Guide to Researching LGBTQ DC. So please pick up a flyer. You can go and find that resource. Thank you, Anne. Um, is there one other principle you want to sort of highlight before we yeah, open up to questions? Yeah, um, I think I think my number one principle is think historically in the archive, not only politically in the news. Think historically in the archive, not just politically in the news. Place current events into the broad historical sweep of things beyond candidates beyond polls or elected officials. Looking back on my experience, uh, we learned how to be comfortable being uncomfortable as LGBTQ Americans making ourselves more vulnerable and more convincing, educating more people over the decades. This is about, I think, our number one issue, which is preserving American democracy and thinking politically about preserving our democracy and then using the archive to get there, I think is a, is a really important principle. Thank you. Thank you all. So I'm going to open it up for questions. And I think we have, how much time do we have for questions? We have about and run it and have you guys pass that back. Sure. We have about 15 minutes for questions. If you ha and you've been thinking about your question that ends in a question mark and not a comment. And I will say that there is plenty of time after this program to have a conversation with Charles and to you know have all of those wonderful comments about this book. But please bring us your questions. So my question is, how do we uh, systematize and uh, institutionalize and scale up this kind of <coughs> activism, which cannot really be done within the existing centralized process? So we have to decentralize. How do we decentralize? How do we bring the kind of massive resources we need? Because it's not just about civil rights, which it is, but it's also about knowledge production, knowledge dissemination, lived experience, which is so often lost. Well, yeah, I mean, um, I would give that to, to my co-founder and lifelong friend, Pate Feltz, because he was able to organize our materials by the tens of thousands of pages. And then we had the help of the law firm. 
and then we had an alliance with one or two libraries, but it was still sort of uh, entrepreneurial. Um, that's why I think the DC History Center is so important because you've got the storage, you've got the people, you've got the structure, you've got the relationships with like the Rainbow History Project or the US Naval Academy. And so I think supporting your library, they live on the front lines uh, of an assault coming their way. So I think support your library and build those alliances uh, to try to institutionalize archive activism. I have a question. Uh, uh, we have a question. Awesome. Yes. I'll come right back over to you. Uh, Charles, you might uh, elaborate, if you don't mind, on your linkage of this community's rights to democracy, knowing what we all have lived through the last few decades, both the black civil rights and LGBTQ rights, where the, the democratic process advances where we are. And contrast that with these countries, how do we fear in those countries that aren't democratic? Thank you. That's a, something I'm very passionate about. Um, if there's one issue, I think that the LGBTQ community needs to come together on one issue, save our democracy. Um, we've learned a lot at the Mattachine Society doing all of this research, how the LGBTQ community got here today. We got here because of democracy. We got here because we knew how to take advantage of the First Amendment and communicate and win people over to our side of the arguments. So uh, when we look at people like Lily Vincennes, we rescued a, a 16 millimeter movie out of her attic. That movie was made by Lily, 16 millimeter film on a blue camera. She learned how to use it and make the first documentary of the first Pride Parade ever. Uh, in New York, New York, it was called the Christopher Street uh, Day Parade up to Central Park. Lily used that film, and, and of course she couldn't get a distribution deal. You could never, the networks were utterly hostile. She had a projector, a 16 millimeter projector, and I have a picture of it in my book. She would travel with that projector and show the film or send it to people in the mail and rent them, uh, charge them $10. This is where democracy worked for us, uh, not to mention people that uh, got into the campaigns like, like Jeff. And when you, when you look at uh, how uh, populist authoritarian regimes worldwide treat our community, compare that. Compare an autocratic system to a democracy, a functioning democracy. I remember Victor Orban went down to Dallas a couple of years ago and spoke, spoke and said, get your hands off our children, you know. That is autocracy. Our democracy is all in these papers, all in the Kameny papers, all in the Vincennes papers. Everything we have demonstrates how the democracy worked and got us here. So, thank you, Jeff. Um, this is more mechanics or process, I guess, but when you, when you uh, uh, were putting the county papers together uh, with your, you had the interns at the law firm or what have you, how long did that take? And when, you, when LC received them, how much work did you have to do to prepare them for public use? Uh, it took a long time, but um, I, I made friends with the historian at the Library of Congress, the Manuscript Division. And he said, do you know what the key tool of an archivist is? It's a long table. <laughs> Just lay them out in piles and then start moving the piles. And then they let Frank come back into the back and help them move the piles. And um, so it was a step-by-step -step thing because these curators, they love what they do. And it's an art. And uh, so Frank was schooled on how to do that. Um, it took a while. And I, yeah, and I just say, I wasn't uh, at the library when the Kameny papers were processed, but um, my colleague, Marita, is in the back, <laughs> who, and she is an archivist uh, in the manuscript division. I'm not gonna call you, like, to come up and 
speak, uh, Marita. But uh, Marita leads a huge team of archivists and technicians, archives technicians, and the library is um, fortunately well resourced to have you know the number of people to work on a project that could take you know years, where it for us it might take a year or two years, sometimes three years. But that includes preserving the materials and arranging and describing and creating a finding aid, a research tool where people can come in and hopefully easily uh, be able to research. Um, so I'm on the board of uh, the Mazer Lesbian Archives. Of the what? The Mazer Lesbian Archives. Um, I obviously live here now. Um, so the Mazer and I think a lot of other community archives are struggling with um, not being able to get new volunteers or younger volunteers um, in along with a lot of other community archives, especially queer archives founded in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Volunteers are now aging. Um, and um, I'm a prime example. I did move out of LA after library school to come here for a job. So I'm just wondering what your experience has been being able to engage younger people in this kind of work. Um, people are working multiple jobs, people have to move for jobs, etc. Well, great question. You know, our number one source uh, of young volunteers was when I would speak at something like this and a, a law student would come up to me and go, how can I help? And I said, well, we need research and we need something on the Sexual Psychopath Act of 1948. Can you figure that out? <laughs> and it gave him a meaningful assignment, something that uh, empowered him. Um, and so volunteers would come to us. Um, Pate, do you have any other thoughts on recruiting uh, volunteers? They come and go, um, but uh, we found a lot of soulmates in the various libraries. Um, sometimes they would step forward after we had already struck out in the library. And one of them came up to Pate at the Ronald Reagan Library and said, you know, I know you're looking for stuff on uh, uh, Rock Hudson, but we have a file and you haven't found anything. But Because we wanted to know why was the Reagan administration silent for seven years? So this librarian came up to pay off the record and said, we have a file folder marked hospitals. I think there's something in there. We could never have guessed hospitals. But she had the file folder and gave us the information. It was Hudson pleading with Nancy Reagan, pleading for his life at the end of his life to help him get into a French hospital that had the experimental therapy he needed. Uh, and Nancy Reagan just shot him down cold. And we found that document. And it was a, was a wonderful particular detail that, that spoke to us about the seven years of silence and uh, it came to us quite by accident from a librarian who kind of off the record tipped us off. <laughs> All right, I think we have uh, time for one more question before um, we break. I just wanted to respond to your question. I'm Glenn with Rainbow History Project, and we had the great opportunity to table at three Pride Festivals uh, here in D.C., a Trans Pride, Black Pride, and Capital Pride, and we had the, the traditional group of volunteers that we that we work with or that we reach out to on our listserv. We, our uh, treasurer is also the treasurer of DC State Fair. He suggested that we table there. So we did that for the first time this year and it was a wealth of new opportunities because we put ourselves out there in a new scenario and a, and a totally different, that's a Venn diagram, but a mostly new audience of people and we garnered three new volunteers to come work with us that day. Um, the partner of one of our board members came, because she wanted to see what was going on. And then a few different uh, individuals that we met that day have since contacted us as well. So it's, it's changing the paradigm and finding where haven't we gone yet. And it was extremely rewarding for the board to, to find those new individuals. All right. 
One lap. You're good? Okay. One last question. Not the last, last question, because obviously you can talk to Charles after this. But if you have a question, you can ask it, and then we will, we will end this portion. It was adding on to You're adding on? <laughs> <laughs> you, it has to be a very short add-on. Because it, it brings together Charles's first point about the intergener intergenerational stuff and attracting people. And one way we at Rainbow History Project try to keep our volunteers is to find ways to bring our community pioneers, who are the people we have on it, and who are now in their 70s and 80s, uh, together with young activists. And that just seems to be essential, that you, you, you get the young, young folks excited about meeting their pioneers, and uh, the pioneers are often isolated. Yeah. Bring them back into the well, that was a perfect add-on. So, thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you. I'm Chris I chair the board of the DC History Center, and I just want to thank both of you for a really terrific uh, program. Another another round of applause. speakers on timely topics, and I hope you will all come back for our, our presentations. But also take a look around tonight. I know there are a lot of new people here. I think our exhibits, some of our exhibits are, are open. I think our gift shop is open. You can buy Charles's book, and you're going to hang around a little while to, sure. to, to sign them. Uh, we have on the 14th of October, I think, is our, our open house, both outside and inside, and hopefully the weather will be better that Saturday than it will be this coming Saturday, and you can all come and, uh, and enjoy uh, some of what the center has to open. So I'm delighted you're here tonight. Please come back, and I want to thank our speakers again for a really a terrific presentation. So please come on out in Memorial Hall and, uh, and meet Charles and my book. Thank you.